Jasper made it much easier for them. They set up an airline, Air America, which was used to transport the drugs into neighboring countries, including Vietnam. I was a freelance journalist and I went to Laos to do this story on the source of the heroin and opium that was flooding into South Vietnam. And I was interviewing opium farmers, how much did you produce last year, what did you do with it? And the answers were always the same. We got about five, maybe ten kilos. At the end of harvest, we went down to that landing pad, uh, an American helicopter came in, paid us cash for the opium, loaded the opium on the helicopter and flew away. Um, the trail of drugs follows the trail of clandestine operations. And there's a very good reason for that. Um, if you're carrying out clandestine operations, you need black money and you need cooperation from criminals. All right. When you to put together black money, untraceable money, and criminals, what does it add up to? Eh, narco trafficking. CIA headquarters had no idea what was going on on the ground in Laos. Their agents in Laos had to keep the local drug traffickers happy in return for their support. So the CIA got their secret army by turning a blind eye to the heroin trade. But what the CIA hadn't thought about was where this heroin was headed. Well, it's what I call mission myopia, turning a blind eye, if you will. It was their troops, their aircraft, and they knew about it at the time. So the CIA uh, was a part of that, and they were moral in that sense. They were, they were loyal to their fighters. But they didn't worry about the fallout, what happened downstream. That was somebody else's business. A huge quantity of the heroin produced by the tribesmen was delivered straight into the hands of the American GIs stationed in Vietnam. In 1969, we adopted a defensive posture. The troops became demoralized. Uh, they were basically combined to fire paces in, in defensive positions, uh, and time was very heavy on their hands. And the way to make 365 days just go blip and disappear was heroin. And the stuff was cheap. It was sold in every bar, every fire base, little tiny screw cap plastic bottles, about uh, $2 a piece. And it was 96% pure heroin. You didn't inject this stuff. You scooped it out, and you snorted it. The White House did a survey in, uh, after the Vietnam War, and they discovered that in 1971, one-third of all U.S. combat forces fighting in Vietnam were heroin addicts. If you do the calculus, okay, there were about mm, 70,000 heroin addicts in the United States in 1969. By 1971, there were 80,000 heroin addicts in the U.S. Army fighting in South Vietnam. That means there were probably more heroin, American heroin addicts inside the U.S. Army in South Vietnam than there were in the United States. So, by 1965, less than 20 years after its formation, the CIA had already got mixed up with heroin traffickers, overthrown governments in Asia and Africa, and tried to control people's minds. But there's more. After the break, I'll be flicking through more of the CIA's secret classified files to bring you revolution, murder, and an unlikely style icon. It was a program of assassination. We summarily executed more than 20,000 people. Well, probably the best way to become an icon is to be assassinated by the CIA. They put their trust in me to lead them to salvation, to birth. But the truth is, we're on the brink of extinction. Our enemy is amongst us. Lies are terrible us apart. Suspicion and doubt will be the downfall of humanity. Because trust. Battle Star Galactica, the new series, Tuesday the 10th of January, Sky One. My name is Danny Wallace, and this is Secrets of the CIA. America has had a secret service since 1946, and throughout those years, it's been responsible for mayhem, murder, and revolution. Coming up, we uncover the CIA's secret assassination program responsible for tens of thousands of deaths. But first, let's take a look at how the CIA turned a man from Cuba into an icon by mistake. Che Guevara went straight to the top of the CIA's most wanted list after organizing the military side of the Cuban Revolution. He wanted to spread communism throughout Central America. The CIA wanted him stopped. By 1967, Che and his band of guerrilla fighters were in the jungles of Bolivia. The USA had had enough. Che had to go. 
The whole concept of guerrilla war was enshrined and symbolized, personified in Che Guevara. So long as he was free, so long as his reputation, which was always greater than his successes, continued to circulate, the idea of armed resistance to American imperialism continued as long as he lived. The CIA was terrified of Che because he was obviously very popular. He was young, he was good-looking, the girls liked him and so on, and he was fashionable. And suddenly communism wasn't sort of, ah, red in tooth and claw uh, communism. It was, hey, Che Guevara, you know, hey, well, could be the father of my baby. So uh, the CIA decided um, it was time to get rid of uh, Che, and they did their very best uh, to assassinate him. In those days, CIA-sponsored assassinations, wet jobs, executive action, whatever you call it, were allowed. And they caught up with him eventually in Bolivia. So the CIA came up with a plan to get rid of him. Felix Rodriguez, the CIA's main man in the hunt for Che Guevara, has admitted to ordering his assassination. Guevara was finally picked up by a Bolivian ranger. Bear in mind, this was a highly trained counter guerrilla force, trained by the Americans, and he was then taken to a, to a small schoolhouse in La Higuera, where he, his presence was announced, and uh, where there was, in particular, one man, Felix Rodriguez, who had been in Cuba, been at the Bay of Pegasus, and was a figure who reappears constantly through the next 30 years of the CIA's history. He was in La Higuera. He claims, his account is, that he received a phone call instructing him to murder Guevara, and all authorized his killing by a local Bolivian sergeant. Che Guevara was murdered on October the 9th, 1967. In the minds of the CIA and the people around them, a dead Che would be one danger less, that he would be eliminated from the scene. To look around the world now in the, in, the, in the beginning of the 21st century and see to what extent the image of Che Guevara has not only persisted, but has been picked up again precisely as a symbol of resistance, of anti-imperialism. You know, if they, if they sought to kill off that idea, they failed. Ironically, a dead Che Guevara became a much bigger problem for the CIA than the live one. Instead of dying away quietly, Shea's face quickly became one of the most recognizable and iconic images in the world. And it still is today. I think Shea became an icon because he stood for something. And it was at a time where revolution was, was in the air in terms of how young people thought, and especially students. The company that I started, you know, Red or Dead, came out of the phrase, better red than dead, and it was all at that time about, about young people thinking about revolution. Increasingly, there's a big industry behind Shea. I remember a, a T-shirt out not so long ago with Jesus done in the same black and red with his crown of thorns, and looking, you had to take a double take to see if it was a Shea T-shirt, if it was a, or if it was a picture of Jesus. But then, more overt than that, you know, you get Ricky Gervais, you get Madonna, you get Citizen Smith. You know, there's all these marketing departments and stylists saying, well, f for this video, do a bit of Shea because you know it, fit, it fits with the style of it, and it'll get you in the press on this and that, and it's a surefire winner. Wow! I think the idea that Che Guevara represented a threat to, to Western democracy was complete balderdash. He was an attractive man who spoke revolution, you know, who smoked cigars, who wore those kind of sexy green fatigues, and, uh, but he didn't represent a threat to the Western world. But in the warped mind of some CIA people, policymakers, they thought this man is potentially very dangerous. You know, he could inflame the young towards the idea of Marxist revolution. Well, probably the best way to become an icon is to be assassinated by the CIA. When the USA became involved in the Vietnam War, everyone in America was convinced that it'd be a short, easy war and that they'd quickly beat the communists. But despite having much more money, guns and bombs, the Americans couldn't win the war in Vietnam. Their opponents in the Viet Cong didn't play by the rules. Instead, they perfected the rules of insurgent fighting still being used today in Iraq. The Americans felt the need to hold the line, uh, to proclaim to the rest of the world that the communists were not going to take over and that freedom and democracy of the sort would flourish. And I, I guess they believed it. The enemy has turned more and more to the use of terror and murder as a way of maintaining its grip on the people, hoping to intimidate them into support as the voluntary support weakens. 
Frustrated by the Army's lack of success in Vietnam, President Lyndon Johnson turned to William Colby, the director of the CIA, for a top-secret answer to the Vietnam problem. The CIA's idea? Wet jobs. Using the Viet Cong's own tactics on itself and making lightning guerrilla raids to kill key Viet Cong leaders. It was called the Phoenix Program. It was a program of assassination. Uh, some of the strategies employed by Phoenix operatives might be uh, to slit a potential Viet Cong, uh, his, his throat in the night, uh, throwing various suspected uh, Viet Cong uh, out of uh, helicopters. You have two of them, you get one of them to talk by throwing the other one out of the helicopter to his death, starving a suspected uh, Viet Cong operative to death. A lot of procedures that, uh, um, while they were excused at the time and in retrospect by people as being absolutely necessary, given the uh, ugly uh, nature of the conflict, uh, I think it's easy to see why so many Americans were uncomfortable with this program and why it became a target for anti-war critics at the time. I saw other interrogations to describe them briefly. The use of the insertion of a six-inch dowel into the semicircular canal of one of my detainee's ears and the tapping through to the brain until he died. My verdict on Phoenix would be, no, it didn't work. Uh, it didn't work, first of all, because obviously the United States lost the war. The Viet Cong infrastructure was not uh, eliminated. Even more than that, I think it, it turned many Vietnamese against the United States. When they saw the tactics being employed, either by Americans themselves or by South Vietnamese who were drawing the paychecks from the United States, uh, I think it killed our image. William Colby, the head of the CIA, later testified before the U.S. Congress that there were more than 20,000 extrajudicial executions done by the United States in the Phoenix program. That's to say, we summarily executed more than 20,000 people. How many, roughly, would you estimate were eliminated? Some 28,000 had been captured, some 20,000 had been killed, and some 17,000 had, had actually rallied by that time. The Phoenix program was a disaster on every single level. It horrified the American public and helped turn them against the war. And what's more, it simply didn't reduce the Viet Cong's military capability. The prospect of a ceasefire has made the position of the Vietnamese in the battle areas any easier. Indeed, it's made it much more difficult. The impact of the Vietnam War on America was, was absolutely colossal. It was the one war that the Americans actually, actually lost. Uh, and that was a huge shock to the system. Whatever they'd done, it hadn't worked. The greatest military machine in the world was powerless to bring about a political solution. And I think it's one of the lessons of the late 20th, early 21st century, that war as we used to understand it doesn't achieve its objectives. Almost never does it achieve its objectives. By 1970, the CIA had perfected the art of overthrowing democratically elected leaders. Iran, Congo and Indonesia had already fallen victim to CIA plots to depose and replace their prime ministers. Now the CIA turned its attentions to Chile with devastating results. In 1970, the people of Chile made the mistake of electing a socialist prime minister, Salvador Allende. Allende was the people's choice, but he wasn't the CIA's choice, so they spent $8 million to get rid of him. Salvador Allende was the first avowed Marxist, it was often said, to actually be elected in the Western world. He was a leader of the Chilean Socialist Party, which was one part of a coalition called Popular Unity. This popular government, we're going to distribute the land. The uh, Mapuches and the in indigenous people in the south are going to have their land back after hundreds of years of, of occupation. We're going to keep our forestry for us. We're going to keep our fish. We're going to keep our... Uh, copper and we're going to distribute it more equally. Here was somebody who at last came to power through the ballot box and here was somebody who was defeated not through the ballot box but by violence. The agency started to pour money into a series of covert operations to discredit Allende, pour money into the anti-Allende political parties, work closely with the Chilean military to build up our influence there, conduct operations to kind of divide and upset Allende's ruling coalition and then a major propaganda operation and that was pouring millions of dollars into the leading anti Allende newspaper El Mercurio transforming El Mercurio into a bullhorn uh, for uh, military operations against uh, Allende. This propaganda operation helped set the stage for the military coup of September 11, 1973. Here counter-revolution started prepared and financed by the United States 
organized by traitorous and disloyal generals and fascists. On September the 11th, 1973, General Augusto Pinochet and his army marched on Santiago, the capital of Chile, and stormed the palace. Salvador Allende was killed in the process. With Pinochet in power, violence, corruption and torture quickly spread throughout Chile. New documents show that in the weeks after the coup, Pinochet's troops arrested around 130,000 people and imprisoned them without trial. What Pinochet did was kill thousands of people. Um, hundreds were executed in the football stadium. One of the favorite ways of dealing with, uh, with dissidents was to take them out in the, uh, over the sea in a helicopter and drop them into the sea. Luis Minoza and his wife Diana were two of the people targeted. I came back home when she never arrived. And I knew that she had been called. I waited. And I waited all night. I was screaming and crying because I knew that I wouldn't. I had a feeling, you know, this is it. And it's true. I became true. Never saw her again. I was taken to this secret torture center. I spent a long time, nearly three months, and then two years in concentration camps. This person is going to be um, tortured till he die or she die. It's going to be suffocated. It's going to be um, raped in the case of women and men as well. I was lucky. One of the survivors. If you walk around Santiago, the capital of Chile, with, with people, they will point out to you every now and then a house which might look quite innocent now, but which is remembered by one generation as a place of torture and horror, where 15 or 20 years ago you could hear the screams from this building. That's the memory, and it takes a very long time for that memory to fade, especially while those who were responsible for those crimes still walk the streets. These are people responsible for the death and the massacre of hundreds and thousands of people. Come on, we're not excused. Pinochet in Chile became a focal point for international condemnation of human rights violations in Latin America and international condemnation of the United States of America for both openly and through the CIA supporting regimes such as Augusto Pinochet. Coming up, we'll be digging even deeper into the files the CIA really doesn't want you to see. All that after the break. Islam is politics or it is nothing at all. Among the victims were both my parents, and my two sisters and 20 other relatives. The war is over, but the dying isn't. Here the CIA was deeply involved. It was clearly an illegal action. Big trouble with the Islamists. There are 1.3 billion of them now, and they're all very mightily upset with us. Hello, my name's Danny Wallace, and this is Secrets of the CIA. We're taking a look through some of the CIA's biggest operations from the last 60 years, and how they've helped shape our world. By 1970, the CIA had spent nearly 10 years in Southeast Asia. It had already played a substantial role in Indonesia, Laos, and Vietnam. And now the CIA focused on Cambodia. Cambodia was a hot spot at the time because of the ongoing war in Vietnam right next door. Prince Sihanouk, Cambodia's ruler, wouldn't play ball with the Americans and join in the Vietnam War. He was determined to stay neutral. Cambodia would not open its doors to American troops. So the CIA did what it always does in these situations. It found someone who would let them into Cambodia and then help them into power. And this person was Lon Nol, a Cambodian general. On March 16, 1970, Lon Nol and the army staged a coup in Cambodia with the full knowledge of the CIA. It's hard to comprehend the level of the military misfits who took over Cambodia under this man called Lon Nol. He was out to lunch when it came to running a war. No doubt the CIA would whisper in his ear every day or the American military mission would pass over their intelligence reports about deteriorating situation on every front. Lon Nol preferred the tea leaves. He was that out of touch. Despite Lon Nol receiving the best help the CIA could offer, he just wasn't very good at government. The CIA had chosen another dodgy leader and left Cambodia to face the consequences. With Lon Nol in charge, the economy failed, people went hungry, 
and the south of the country got bombed by the Americans. These conditions allowed the Khmer Rouge, a vicious and extreme communist party, to gain more and more support under its now notorious leader, Pol Pot. In March 1975, the Khmer Rouge invaded the capital of Cambodia, Phnom Penh, and overthrew Lon Nol and his government. We leave a capital swollen with refugees. Nearly two million people are now concentrated in Phnom Penh. In five years, the men who overthrew Prince Sihanouk have lost the war. Within a few days, the communists will be taking over. My first memory of the war coming to my home was when the soldiers and their trucks poured into the city and my family along with two million Cambodians um, living in the city of Phnom Penh were evacuated in 72 hours. All vestiges of development or modern influence were dismantled or destroyed. Electricity was unnecessary in the new society so wire was removed to be used for something more productive. The Khmer Rouge wanted to create this pure, new, utopian agrarian society. And all those people who weren't farmers were a danger to this new society. And, and those were um, the doctors, the lawyers, the architects, the civil servants, the politicians. So they sent out their soldiers into the countryside, and, and they collected these people and executed them en masse. The three years, eight months, and 21 days of Khmer Rouge rule claimed the lives of 1.7 to 2 million Cambodians. Among the victims were both my parents, my two sisters, and 20 other relatives, where they've located over 20,000 mass graves in Cambodia. And they were killed with the blunt instruments at the back of their heads. The CIA was one of those elements trying to prop up the American position, but as an attempt to implant American democratic values in Indochina, it was rubbish, it failed. The Angolan Civil War began in 1975 and didn't end until 27 years later in 2002. Years of fighting between warring tribes left 750,000 Angolans dead and a further 5 million more as refugees. There's no doubt that the CIA's involvement in this conflict helped keep the Civil War going and caused thousands of deaths. And all this to protect American interests in Africa. Angola was one of the few examples of U.S. interventions where the Soviet Union was actually involved. There were three guerrilla groups fighting against Portuguese rule for many years. The Soviets were backing one of them. The U.S. and China were backing the other two. And it turned out to be one big horror. Angola was one of the great battlefields of the Cold War. And it's hard to recollect now, but I was there at the time. The East Germans provided the internal security apparatus. The Russians were there in a, in a, in a big way. The Cubans were massively involved, playing the leading role uh, in the new Angolan army against an incursion by the South Africans from the south. So, of course, the Americans were, were anxious. South Africa was on the side of the U.S., which in the minds of the, the rest of Africa was a big uh, scandal that the U.S. was fighting alongside South Africa. It was very difficult for the, the Americans to promote a, a positive image of themselves uh, in Africa as long as they had their, their, their ties to the apartheid regime. So the Americans were never going to be popular uh, in Africa as long as that situation prevailed. The CIA chose to influence the conflict in the most convenient way it could. It spread propaganda and pumped money into Angola. Millions of dollars were provided for mercenaries and nearly 100 agents were sent to the country. One's well, talking about a relatively small number of people in terms of station chiefs and different oper operatives, in terms of the assets as they call them, the, 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 the local uh, allies that you know, they pay and run as agents. And a lot of it was funneling money. So the CIA, for relatively small amounts of money, were able to 
manipulate and shape and change uh, the, the, the destinies of, of, of a huge amount of people. The Civil War in Angola was the longest running war, I believe, uh, anywhere in the world in the 20th century. People are being blown up by anti-personnel mines and landmines every day to this day in, in Angola because no one knows where they're all buried. So it's one of these situations where, where the war is over but the dying isn't. The CIA is meant to have eyes and ears everywhere. Their reason for being is to know exactly what's going on everywhere around the world at all times, ever. But more often than not, the CIA's intelligence lets them down. In the 1970s, the CIA thought Iran was a success story. Back in the 50s, they'd installed the Shah of Iran into power and had spies running all over the country. But the spies didn't do a very good job. The CIA had no idea whatsoever that one of the biggest events of the late 20th century was about to occur in Iran. In February 1979, the Iranian people staged the first ever Islamic revolution, which not only changed the face of Iran, but changed the face of the entire Middle East. And the CIA had no idea that any of this was going to happen. Iran was a major warning, but Iran was also a major intelligence failure. And at least CIA Director Admiral Turner at that time very honestly admitted that this was a failure that he couldn't even understand. Our experts on Iran just were not clued in. They just did not have a sense of the culture, the sense of what was going on in that country. It certainly was a big gap in, in our coverage, and I am to blame for that. I did not push them uh, in that direction, and I should have. The city of Gum, Iran's holy city. It's the center of the Shia Muslim community, and it's the home of the man who was head of state in all but name, the Ayatollah Khomeini. It was Ayatollah Khomeini who changed the nature of uh, political Islam forever when he said Islam is politics or it is nothing at all. The idea that this old cleric could come and overthrow 30 years of the most powerful uh, Western ally in the Middle East didn't make any sense. I mean, Americans, uh, like most Westerners, I don't think are terribly adept at looking at issues of religion. The contact, the association, the understanding with clerics seldom happens. On November the 4th, 1979, the U.S. Embassy in Iran was invaded by Islamic militants. Sixty-five American citizens, including many CIA officers, were taken hostage and were held for an incredible 444 days. By failing to understand the degree of hatred of the people in the streets, I think they failed to predict um, uh, the invasion of the embassy and the hostage-taking uh, crisis, which, which was probably one of the most humiliating things that uh, the United States had to face, and it really brought an end to the Carter administration. A top-secret military mission to rescue the hostages, which had been planned by the CIA, collapsed in failure and caused the deaths of eight American soldiers. It was unbelievable that such things could happen to the USA, the world's greatest superpower, and the impact is still being felt today. The Americans have still got this dream about being American. And what the Iranians did in that siege was to humiliate people who don't believe they can be defeated. And it's, the Americans have never got over it. They have never got over it. Now, when things go wrong at the CIA, they go wrong in a pretty big way. And one of the very public mistakes they made in the 1980s ended up becoming the biggest political scandal of Ronald Reagan's presidency. Since the early 1980s, the CIA had been interfering in a civil war in Nicaragua. The CIA were funding the right-wing Contra guerrillas in their fight against the left-wing Sandinista government. It was a movement with mass popular support that had overthrown a peculiarly vicious and vile dictatorship, a dictatorship which nobody in their right mind would defend. For the next 10 or 11 years, the government that arose out of that revolution faced military assault, economic attacks from the US, and here the CIA was deeply involved. The Nicaraguan government claims over 10,000 civilians have been wounded, killed, or kidnapped by the Contras. 
But in 1983, the American Congress voted to cut off funding for this war. The CIA was brought in to find a secret way to get these funds to the Contras in Nicaragua. In late 1983, two CIA men, Richard Secord and Albert Hakim, met with representatives of the National Security Council. They came up with a plan to fund the Contras, which united their new friends in Nicaragua with their old enemies in Iran. The U.S. government, the military, and with some help from the CIA, started selling arms to uh, Iran illegally and using some of the profits of those exorbitant sales to fund the Contra Wars. It was clearly an illegal action, and the CIA participated in that uh, by facilitating the shipment of arms through private hands. This operation wasn't only against the law, it was also foolish. The USA had declared Iran to be a terrorist state after the hostage crisis of 1979, but here was the CIA handing over tons and tons of arms to Iran and Ayatollah Khomeini. To this day, the exact amount of money the CIA generated from these weapon sales is still unclear, but we do know that Iran paid $47.6 million into a CIA-controlled Swiss bank account, which was then handed over to the Contras. If illegal acts were undertaken, those who did so will be brought to justice. Join hearings of the... the hearings into the Iran-Contra affair began in May 1987 and resulted in the prosecution of key CIA officials and National Security Agency personnel. The deputy director of the CIA and a couple of other CIA officials were actually found guilty, um, in the end, pardoned by the first President Bush. Thank you, God bless you, and good night. The Iran-Contra affair was immensely damaging to America's reputation throughout the world, but it was equally damaging within the United States because it raised issues of trust. We all like to think of our governments as being A, reasonably competent, and B, acting within the law. In this case, this, there was neither. The last great battle of the Cold War was played out not in Russia or in the USA, but in Afghanistan. In 1980, Ronald Reagan sent the CIA into Afghanistan. Their secret mission was to fund, train and arm the Mujahideen, a band of Islamic Afghani fighters. They were at war with the Soviet-backed People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. The CIA was told to crush the Soviet fighting force by any means possible. And it did just that by working closely with the Mujahideen. They were good lads. Everybody thought they were, you know, good hardened fighters. Andy McNabb was employed by the CIA in the early 1980s to train the Mujahideen. We taught them how to um, make improvised explosive devices, the timer units, how to take down helicopters, telecommunications, uh, power lines. We were teaching them um, not only the, the conventional stuff, how to use ground-to-air missiles, um, but actually how to make improvised e explosives and how to make explosives. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Money talks all over the world. It talks even louder in some of the countries that the CIA have to go and operate in. And they do carry around large bags of large denomination dollar bills. You can't get the exact total of money the Americans spent to help the Mujahideen defeat the Soviets, but it's around the three billion mark. I was, in, 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 in the most realistic sense, the 19th century British political agent and quartermaster. Uh, and so I delivered 60,000 tons of ordnance. I spent a lot of money every month unilaterally providing it to Afghan commanders throughout Afghanistan. I could get on a secure radio link and say, Joe, I'll get your stuff. And they would come back and say, cut our stuff. Milt Bearden might have thought funding and arming the Mujahideen was a good idea, but many of his fellow CIA officers didn't agree. I myself had a conversation with Milt Bearden, who was the CIA operative who was controlling this operation. And I said, Bearden, what are you doing? You're giving this weaponry to the most fundamentalist people of them all. Uh, this is not going to work for U.S. strategic interests over the long term. And I thought Bearden's reaction was interesting. He said to me, look, we just passed them the weapons, and we let God sort it out. Well, God sorted it out. Uh, and we're still dealing with that problem now. Let me tell you, uh, we never gave a single penny to a single Arab group. They themselves were bringing in up to $20, 25000000 million a month that was being brought in from the Gulf to go into the war. That's their issue. We were there with our goals. But uh, this has been a story that has always been too good to check for most journalists. CIA did not fund Osama bin Laden. CIA did not create the Taliban. Uh, the U.S. didn't do that, and it consciously didn't do it. It didn't do it. Uh, as a matter of policy. And uh, I always uh, 
like to dismiss those critics as saying, I was there, you weren't, I know it, you don't uh, trump that. They didn't fully understand that what the Mujahideen were thinking, not the Afghans, but more the Arabs and the international jihadists, what they were thinking is, thanks very much. When we've dealt with this lot, we'll deal with you. This is the, the, the blowback bit of American foreign policy. They armed, funded, and to an extent trained some of the Arabs not realizing that they would come after the Americans once they'd finished with the Soviets. Maybe there would still have been an Al-Qaeda without Afghanistan, but it might have taken much longer for it to come about. Once the Mujahideen won its war against the Soviets, the CIA upped sticks and left Afghanistan. The CIA men had accomplished their covert mission, and they didn't care what happened to Afghanistan after they left. When the Soviets finally withdrew, the Americans effectively withdrew their interest in Afghanistan. They ceased to be concerned about what happened to it. And far from continuing to intervene, they effectively left the field open for the Taliban to come in with the consequences that we understand. The agency's role in Afghanistan can be looked at in two ways, it seems to me. In the short-term perspective, sure, the agency drove the Russians out. But over the long term, well, you know, it's big trouble with the Islamists. There are 1.3 billion of them now, and they're all very mightily upset with us. Every spy organization's worst nightmare is the discovery of an enemy within the agency. I don't need to tell you that. Moles, double agents, and defectors can inflict massive damage on the country they're meant to be working for. And the CIA has first-hand knowledge of just how damaging an enemy within can be. You never think there's a spy in your neighborhood. On February 24th, 1994, Aldrich Ames, a CIA Soviet expert who'd worked at the CIA for nearly 30 years, was arrested with a suitcase stuffed full of cash and a plane ticket to Russia in his pocket. As the case unfolded, the CIA discovered that Aldrich Ames had been spying for the Soviets for nearly 10 years. And the information he'd provided to the KGB left the CIA in a state of chaos which they're still recovering from today. One thing that everybody has learned throughout history uh, is that if a person is dedicated to betraying their country, uh, while they may eventually be caught, it takes a while. There's no immediate solution. There's no magic truth detector. There's no truth serum. There's nothing that can solve the problem immediately. I met a handler who was handling uh, Aldrich Ames uh, in the um, early 90s. And this handler believed that with the information being provided by Ames, the Soviet leadership could change the course of events in the Cold War with the United States. So the stakes were high. Ames had one of the most sensitive jobs in American intelligence, serving for three years as chief of the CIA office charged with protecting CIA operations from the KGB. Understandably, this is the one place the CIA couldn't afford to have a spy. Yet Ames continued to pass top-secret information to the Soviets for years, and the KGB paid him handsomely for it. Money don't get everything, it's true. What it don't get, I can't use. I want money. Ames had no ideology. Ames did this because he thought he should be making more money. He wanted nice cars, he wanted a nice house, he wanted a lifestyle that he wasn't able to earn on a government salary. And he believed that by handing over information, that that would bring him a fortune, and in fact, it did. It was in excess of $2 million and probably closer to $2.5 million, which would have made him probably the highest paid spy in history. He traded people's lives for $2.5 million. He pled guilty. He received a sentence of life imprisonment without parole, and he's currently serving it today. Aldrich James was responsible for a number of the CIA's most important sources uh, in uh, Russia and the Soviet Union uh, being compromised, caught, and executed. The dreams caused the death of these people as surely as if he had pulled the trigger. This was a major intelligence disaster, and the response of the CIA to those disasters uh, was really uh, almost tragic. It was unable to figure out for many years how it was compromised, how it was penetrated by the Russian intelligence service. For more than 10 years, Aldrich Ames handed over hundreds of secrets to the Soviets, and no one in the CIA had any idea he was a mole. Aldrich James was unquestionably the most damaging spy that the CIA ever experienced. It uh, 
it destroyed morale within the agency, and it uh, caused damage that is lasting to this day. The fact that he was able to betray so many great assets in the Soviet Union is despicable. We had a huge betrayal inside, and uh, the turmoil from that is <clears throat> goes on to this day. These are the secrets of the CIA, and in our final part, we're coming right up to date with intelligence issues that are still making front pages around the world today. After the break, we'll be looking into just how the CIA got it so wrong on Iraq and on 9-11. They missed it. They missed it completely. It's very unlikely we can stop the next attack in America. Weapons of mass destruction was a fantasy. What we had is the CIA lying, cheating, and deceiving the American people itself for the benefit of the president. Welcome back to Secrets of the CIA. We've already looked at the CIA's operations since its founding in the 1940s, right up to how it saw the Soviets off in Afghanistan. In our final part, we'll bring the CIA's story right up to date, starting with one of the defining moments of our time. On September 11th, 2001, the unthinkable happened. 2,992 people died that morning in the USA as everyone around the world watched the attack unfold live on television. In the days after 9-11, it became clear that the USA and the CIA knew exactly who was responsible for these attacks. The CIA had been watching Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda network for years, but had done nothing to stop them carrying out the terrorist attacks of 9-11. When the attack of 9-11 occurred, I think more than anything else, it was a feeling that this probably didn't have to have happened had we been more aggressive uh, against Osama bin Laden. This whole operation, months in the planning, relatively expensive in terrorist terms, and in so involved and intricate, completely got by them. They missed it. They missed it completely. God, that was a failure of intelligence. It was a failure of imagination. It was a systemic failure of every intelligence service uh, that was in the least bit professional. Someone who knows exactly what's inside the CIA's classified bin Laden files is Mike Schuer, the CIA analyst responsible for spying on al-Qaeda from late 1995. The agency began looking at Osama bin Laden uh, primarily because of external factors. In the middle 90s, we shifted away from a kind of an exclusive look at uh, Lebanese Hezbollah and, other, and the Palestinian groups to a broader look at Sunni extremism around the world. And almost wherever we looked, bin Laden's name came up as a, a benefactor, as an inspiration, or as a nuts and bolts provider of uh, uh, military weapons or documents. The very reason the CIA exists is to stop America's enemies from attacking the USA. Yet the CIA failed to gather any intelligence about the World Trade Center attack before it occurred. Bin Laden pretty much set it out what his strategy was going to be against the United States. There weren't a lot of surprises in Bin Laden. So when you look at the analytical work that the CIA ultimately and the failure to realize the role of al-Qaeda in 1993 in the World Trade Center and the fact that Bin Laden always bent back to his failures to try to get it right, you have to wonder how in the world did this intelligence failure take place? Incredibly, this wasn't the first time allies of Osama Bin Laden had tried to blow up the Twin Towers. Back in 1993, Islamic terrorists bombed the World Trade Center, killing six people and injuring over a thousand more. Yet the CIA still had no idea what was coming on 9-11. We did not have enough people, and we did not have enough people who were experienced on the Sunni target, on the Islamic target generally, and that remains true to this day. We had heard testimony d by George CIA Director George Tenet during the 9-11 uh, uh, investigation that uh, he had declared war on al-Qaeda uh, in the late 1990s. However, uh, the investigators were able to uncover that uh, he had only applied maybe one or two or as many as half a dozen analysts, uh, so one has to question what kind of war that was. By assigning only a few people to the al-Qaeda investigation, the CIA made a huge mistake. But it wasn't the CIA's only error in handling the bin Laden case. They simply didn't have enough Arabic speakers. They didn't have enough Arabic speakers, crucially, on the ground in the Middle East. And they didn't have enough that are listening to all the stuff and reading all the stuff and analyzing all the stuff. And so in that respect, they were blind. They learned the hard way. It's no good 
watching from a satellite and listening from the radio bug. You've got to have more than that. They are only just now beginning to start to infiltrate. They're paying lots of money to people, and they are getting sometimes fairly good information. But they're starting from 911, where, of course, we now know they should have started in the early 90s. If the CIA failed to spot 9-11, then you have to ask, will it be able to do anything to stop the next attack? At the end of the day, law enforcement and the CIA is faced with an impossible task because no one has moved forward in protecting the borders of the United States. It's very unlikely we can stop the next attack in America. When Bush and Blair proposed the invasion of Iraq back in early 2003, both leaders insisted the only reason for the war was to stop Saddam from using his weapons of mass destruction on the rest of the world. They claimed this wasn't a humanitarian mission to save the Iraqi people from Saddam or one to secure access to Iraq's rich oil reserves. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. The president stood before the world and presented an intelligence report from the CIA that proved Saddam had weapons of mass destruction and that he was intent on using them. Fast forward two years and we all now know that no weapons of mass destruction have ever been found in Iraq. The CIA either made a massive intelligence mistake or it chose to sex up its estimate to give Bush the war he wanted. The story is still unfolding. Scott Ritter, a UN chief weapons inspector who worked in Iraq before the war, maintains the CIA knew that Saddam had disarmed, but that they chose to ignore the facts. Weapons of mass destruction was a fantasy. We had accounted for the production equipment, we had accounted for the spare parts, we had accounted for the missiles. And yet when I briefed the CIA, they rejected it. They said that our, our, our work was flawed because it relied upon uh, statements made by Iraqi officials that uh, couldn't be trusted. Um, the CIA said there were up to 200 missiles left in Iraq. We found nothing. It didn't matter what the facts were. They had no intention of allowing the inspectors ever to determine that Iraq had complied with its obligation to disarm. The CIA turned to weapons expert Robert Gallucci to analyze their intelligence for them. I thought that there was a very good case, uh, even a conclusive case, uh, that Iraq had regenerated its programs in chemical weapons and biological weapons. Uh, I came to that conclusion, I think, based on assumptions about Iraqi intentions, Saddam was still there, capabilities, scientists were still there, time, opportunity, been four years without inspectors. The way in which the intelligence services looked at the Saddam Hussein regime was as a type of regime that lied about whether it had weapons of mass destruction or not. Consequently, they interpreted almost every bit of information which seemed to suggest that he might have as being information showing that he did have. They didn't have somebody inside their regime at a high enough level who knew exactly what the truth was. And it was all satellite images. It was all guys who'd escaped 10 years earlier. The information wasn't new enough. The information wasn't hard enough. The CIA made serious errors when analyzing the intelligence coming out of Iraq before the war. What we had is the CIA lying, cheating, and deceiving the American people itself for the benefit of the president. Uh, and that's a violation of the moral compass of the CIA, if there is indeed a moral compass at the CIA. This is wrong. Nowhere in the CIA's program does it say, thou shalt tell the big boss that which he wishes to hear. And if that is what the CIA now does, then they can boil it down to one person. You just hire a yes man. He can walk around telling you what you want to hear. Making intelligence mistakes is one thing. But many argue that George Tenet, the CIA director, fixed the WMD report to back up President Bush in his drive to go to war with Iraq. Come in here and say thank you. There's no way the director of the CIA could have believed any of the intelligence information they had out there that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. If he believed it, he was incompetent. The whole world now knows how massively the CIA got it wrong on WMD. Trust in the CIA is at an all-time low. The next time 
any Western politician says, believe me, I've got these really cool secret documents that say that there's a bad guy out there and we've got to go get him. I mean, he'll be, be out of office the next day. I mean, it's now the most comical lie you can tell in politics. Even people with goodwill uh, say, yeah, look, everyone agreed, everyone agreed that he had WMD, but you still made a mistake. Why should we believe you this time? Whether this time is North Korea, whether it's Iran, whether it's something around the corner that they're trying to look at that's going to come up and bite us, whatever it is, people are going to be even more skeptical than they always have been. The threat to this country, the threat to the world, is terrorism. And the antidote to terrorism is intelligence. We're at war with Islamist extremists, and in war, you have to take some extraordinary measures in order to be successful. They simply have to be dealt with. The Osama bin Laden's in the cells of people that are still out there. They just simply have to be removed. The CIA is going to target someone. If there's going to be an assassination plot, we're going to uh, bloody our own image around the world and create more terrorists. <laughs> When you have an agency that operates in the dark, you are going to have extraordinary abuses of power. The truth is that people are dying in our name, people are getting murdered in our name, people are being experimented on in our name. No, no, no! The CIA, as it's currently manifested, not be tolerated. It must be done away with. We would be better off today just doing away with the CIA and starting over. It's a deadly, subversive cancer of corruption and incompetence. Uh, within American society and as a projection of that society overseas. It's, it's an enormous danger. I'd have to say, unless we have a second 9-11, the odds of the agency changing over the next 25 years are almost zero. So, happy birthday to all our friends at the CIA. That's 60 years of defending our liberty, or, to put it another way, attacking our freedoms. And as we enter the fifth year on the war on terror, please don't think for a moment that the CIA will play any less of a role, or that it'll use any less controversial tactics than it has done in the last 60 years. Expect to see plenty more headlines and to hear plenty more secrets of the CIA in the years to come. Good night.